Hello everyone, welcome back to our channel. In today's tutorial, we will teach you how to create grasshopper models through the use of simple math and transformations, and how can that significantly improve your computation speed, but also your workflows. But before we get started, don't forget to like this video and to subscribe if you haven't done so. So let's get started. So to begin with, what are transformations? What are they used for? So here in Grasshopper, the main section of our toolbar where we have all these transformations components are in this area, the transform area. And here we have different sections where we have all of the components that are relevant for this tutorial. Um, so the most known ones in Grasshopper are of course scale, move, rotate, mirror, orient, etc. But there is also other ones here that we have that are swarf, bend deform, spatial deform, box morph, etc. These ones that we see here are in this area, the morph area. But these ones are not what we want because these ones are actually affecting, changing fundamentally our geometry. Um, and that takes way more time, way more computation time. And that's not what we want. The only thing that we want to do is this. Transform in the sense of scaling, moving, rotating. So we are externally um, affecting our geometry without really going directly into it. And for example, moving the vertices of a mesh or deforming um, our um, surfaces. So again, this is not what we want. This is what we want. And the best way you can know which components don't affect our mesh, our um, geometry fundamentally, is in the outputs. So if a component, if a transform component in the outputs contains this X value, this X output, uh, which is the transform output, that's a component that will compute very um, fast. That's because this X output contains a matrix. This matrix store all the information that we need to be able to transform our geometry. So we are talking here about 16 numbers and each of these numbers represent um, a value that will be used to transform our geometry. So in this example, we have, for example, a scale matrix. So here we have that the X scale. So we are going to scale our geometry in the X axis is storing this section of the matrix. Then we have the Y scale and the Z scale. So all of these three numbers are the only thing that are changed when transforming um, our geometry through a scale. This is just for you to know the fundamentals of how this component works and why it is why these components are um, fast to compute, but you don't really need to uh, dig deep in, in this topic. It's just for us to have a good base and understanding of how these components work. So if we go here to the math section, we have here the matrix, and here we have the display matrix component. So just to see how this transform gets uh, converted into matrix. So here we can see um, our factor here is 0 0.5. So as we saw here, we have X, Y, Z, and here we have also X, 0 0.5, Y, 0 0.5, and Z, 0 0.5. Now let's go to the move. The move has similar concept. We have X, Y, Z, but now in this area of the matrix. And if we check here our move, this move has, it says that it's just going to move in the Z direction 10 units. So here we have 0, 0. And then we have a 10 here, which represents the same Z that we have in this um, representation of our matrix of how the data is stored. Now, when we go to the rotation, it, it becomes a bit more complicated because of course the rotation uh, needs to have also a plane, for example, so an orientation of how this um, rotation is gonna happen in respect to which plane. And as you know, rotation contains other types of rotation. So for example, rotation, rotate direction. This one also has an X, but there is way more input. So this component normally rotate, um, the rotate instruction, rotate transformation normally affects way more of our matrix. 
And as I said, we don't really need to dig that much into this, just to have a basic understanding of how it works. For example, here, the mirror is the same than on a scale, because at the end of the day, it's like we are scaling um, in the negative direction, depending on our plane. So for example, in this one, we have the YZ plane, and our uh, scaling, here, the X scaling, is going to minus one, and there is stay, stays to one. So this mirror is basically like it will, if we were doing a, a scale. It's basically the same. So um, now that we have the basics of how these transformations work, now we can look for any other component that could have this kind of output, because this is what will that what will help us make our models fast when computing with transformations. So for example, in Pufferfish, they also have, uh, this component also have has a um, transform section. And here we can find other components, for example, move to point, which also contains this X value. There is also others here, scale to area also contains the X value. So anything that contains this X value is going to be useful for the workflow of using transformations. Anything else, even though it is in the transform section, no, this morph papar, it is actually going beyond transforming, beyond this matrix, and it's actually affecting our geometry, and that will make our computation way slower. So focus just on the models that contain this X value. Now, how can that help us? How can that benefit us? The first thing how these um, transformations can benefit us is through the, our workflow. How do we develop our models? So here I have uh, an example. Uh, so now let's display Rhino. So here in this example, I have this rectangle, which is going to be, let's say, our um, house. And in this house, we are going to put, let me just hide some stuff here. In this house, in these uh, walls, let's say, we are going to put some windows. So some a way of doing this, which is not the most efficient way, would be I take my rectangle, I explode it, so I get each segment. So in this case, we have four segments in our uh, list. And then I start to edit each of these segments, each of these walls in our house um, independently. So here I have, okay, I get a point in my cure. So this is the front, the front um, part of my house. Then I move it in Z. So let's say I want my window to be off the ground. And I need to then give the XZ plane because we are in this wall which is lying on the XZ plane. And I create finally a rectangle with these values, the width and height um, values of our window. Then I create a boundary surface and then I extrude, but I have to extrude in the Y direction because I am in the XZ plane. Now, Let's go to the next wall. So in the next wall, I get this point here. So I get this point here. I move it in Z the same, but now I don't have to use the XZ plane. Now I have to use the YZ plane. Why? Because we are in a different wall. Then we need to consider this. Then uh, our, our model, the, uh, our first logic is a little bit different than the second one. Then we do the game boundary surface and then we extrude. But this time we have to extrude in the X axis, uh, in the X vector uh, and reverse, so in the minus X vector. And if you go to the next wall, same situation, but now we have to have again the XZ plane and now we have to go negative Y. Here it goes Y and here we have to go negative Y. And finally, the last wall, um, we have to go back to the YZ plane and the X positive, here we had the X negative to make the extrusion. And in that way, uh, we get 
all of our windows positioned in our wall. So what's the problem of this? The problem is that if you see each of our groups here, like um, script groups, components group, look pretty similar or almost the same than the next one and the next one and the next one. It's like a repetition one after the other of pretty much the same workflow. We just have some fundamental changes. The fundamental changes are here in this color, magenta color, which is the plane and the uh, direction in which we are extruding. One solution would be to use clusters and uh, somehow give this as an input in our clusters. If you don't know what a cluster is, uh, please uh, have a look at it online because it's a very um, good tool to work when you are using Grasshopper. However, that's not our focus right now. We don't want to focus on clusters. So if we don't use clusters, what is um, the next solution? And the next solution would be using transformations. So we have uh, the next um, iteration here where we have uh, the settings of each window here. So we have the same that we had in the previous one with high position in Z and position along the curve. So we have exactly the same in that respect. We have exactly the same um, wall here. But the main difference, it's here. I have, I am creating my windows always, always in the XZ plane, always. Um, so you can see here, all of them is like all of them are one on top of each other. But it doesn't matter because, uh, well, then I do the boundary surface and then I do the extrusion always in the positive one. So now I don't have to care about, oh, now I'm in wall two, so now I have to use a different direction. I'm in wall three, now I have to use the direction X, Y, Z, etc. No, I don't worry anymore. Always Y, always X, Z. But now what do I do? Because now my windows are all stacked one on top of each other. Well, then now I can just transform them. Um, so in this case, we have um, our rectangle. We do the same explosion. Then we... Um, calculate the point in each of these segments where our our um, windows will be positioned and then I calculate the uh, plane that I'm going to use to move to orient our uh, rectangles so in this case I'm just using the vector of our segment and a cross product to be able to construct the final plane, the final orientation and in that way, I end up in the same place. Um, but now, I didn't have to. I, don't, I didn't have to repeat myself four times doing the same logic as we had it here. So, in terms of, um, let's say that I need to change something in the future in this model, and I need to, I don't know. Maybe I need to now create a frame. So let's say this is the, the glass of my window and I want to create a frame around my glass. Well, now I have to go and change every single ones of every single one of these ones and make sure that I don't forget that this one was changed, but this one didn't because they need to be pretty much exactly the same in workflow. And because you also need to consider your, your direction if you are in the X, Y plane or et cetera, then it's, it starts to get very messy. Whereas in this one, I do everything in the origin. I do all of these windows in the origin without uh, considering the final orientation. And just at the end, I use transformations to move my windows. Now, this is still not the best. This is still a semi-efficient uh, method. You are still, now you can easily um, update your model and your workflow is a bit uh, better, but it's not the best. What is the best? will be something similar as what we just did, but now we are using just transformations. I'm not even creating a single piece of geometry. How is that? I have exactly the same workflow here. So I'm detecting my point. I'm also including the Z direction here. So before I was, in, I was moving already in Z, my windows through the rectangle, but here I'm also including the Z. So basically I have my point here in the, in the rectangle, you can see the points here. 
Then I'm moving them, so I'm adding the Z direction. So now I have my points off the ground. Then I do the same, I create the plane. This is exactly as we just did. I'm also creating the, I'm also using the orientation, but as you can see, I'm not giving any geometry now because I'm not creating any geometry. The only thing that matters here now is my orient, my, uh, my transformation output, which is the X value that we explained at the beginning. Now, how do I now get my window? Because before we had our rectangle, but now how do I create my, my rectangle? Well, now we can use the scale and U component, which lets me scale independently in the X, Y, and Z uh, axis. Um, and I can do the same that we were doing before. In the X, we get the width of the window. In the Z, we get the height of the window. And in the Y, we get the thickness of the window. And with this, I can scale a piece of geometry that I have here. It's just an internalized one by one by one cube. That's all what it is. I have a little cube here, which is one by one by one. So that means that if I scale this one unit cube 10 times, it's going to be 10 units of width or 100 units of width. Or if I scale it in Z, same, same situation. So I could do this if I wanted to. And we could see the final result directly. So if I put here the, the mesh into the geometry, you can see that my mesh, my one by one by one cube is being scaled exactly this amount of times. So I get into the same result, but I never created geometry. I just transformed geometry. But we can be even more efficient. And what we can do is use this compound component this compound component basically takes one transformation from one side, takes one transformation from the other side, and join them together. So what we saw here with these um, 16 numbers that are used to, to store our um, transformation uh, instructions, that's what this compound component is doing. It's taking the numbers of, the, of one um, transform, the numbers of the other, the other 16 numbers, and joining them together so we have a single matrix that we are going to apply to our model, to our mesh in this case. Um, so here what I do is I use the merge component, I graph each of our inputs so that in the output I have couples of, of transformations. So each of my branch, each of my branches is two transformations. Branch number zero is three, two transformations, branch number one, two transformations, etc. So that at the end, this component, this compound component will um, join these two into a single transform. What is very important to consider here is that this compound has into account the order in which you add these um, transformations. So the first thing that we want to do before orienting our geometry is to scale our geometry. We don't want to orient and then scale because then let's say if I do that here, I'm just going to reverse. So let's say I'm sending first, um, first orient and then scale. If I reverse this, then this becomes a mess. I don't even, yeah, here you can see one of the windows is somewhere there. So it becomes completely out of place. Why? Because if I do this, what is it, what this component is doing is first our little mesh is going to be positioned in place. And then it's going to be scaled this amount in respect to the origin. So basically, the, the scale factor is completely out of place, which is exactly what we did here. We first scale or created our real size windows, and then we orient. We didn't do the opposite. So exactly the same here. We want to first scale, first give the real size based on the XY plane, um, and then, then we do the orientation. Now this component, you can put as many transformations as you want. I could continue here. Let's say that then I want to add a rotation and then I want to add a mirror and then I want to add etc. 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 So you can add here as many transformations as you want. And at the end, this compound will give you back a single transformation with, um, the combination of them. So we can see here 
is a compound transformation where we have two transformations inside them. And finally, we use this transform component, which is also found um, here. So util, we have the transform uh, section. Here is where we also found the compound, by the way. So here we have compound, here we have the transform. Here we have other options also to invert, invert the transformation or to split it. So if I have here my compound with two, I could also do the opposite and then split it and get back again my um, two original transformations. So here we go from, from couples to a singles. And here we go from single transformation again from two couples. So it could be useful in terms of if, if you want to somehow manipulate these transformations. Okay, so this is the best way to do it. Um, and in this way, I can create complete models without ever creating a single piece of geometry. Now, this is in terms of workflow. What about uh, optimization? So if I want to make me, my model way, way faster. So here we have an example. So we have here an example where we are creating this brick wall. So we know that a brick has the size of, uh, here I have it, a brick width of 90, brick height of 90 as well, and a brick length of 190. So each of these units here that you see, each of these cubes is one brick. And the only thing that I want to do is to move these bricks in the y direction, some more than others, to create a pattern here. In this case, I don't know if you have noticed, but here, of course, we have a little puppy. So if I check here, we can get our little puppy. So this little puppy that we see here, we are now mapping it into these bricks. Um, to that, we are to, to get this this bitmap. We are using we are using the import bitmap component from ShapeDiver, and now and then we are sampling this um, image through our ShapeDiver image sampler component, similar to the one that is used normally by Grasshopper developers. Image sampler is just that um, it works differently because we are getting the information through this component instead of through a local file but it's pretty much the same. Um, now, here the main point is that we are creating this grid. We are saying that now our resolution is 100 by 100. So we have 100 bricks and 100 bricks. And um, then we use the boundary surface to create each of our rectangles as um, surfaces. And finally, we are extruding so that we get each of our bricks. Then after that, after we get our bricks um, in 3D as a B-Wrap, we can then move them. We can move them in the Y direction and we get our final result. Now, uh, as you can see, we have already some computation problems here. It's not that bad, but what if I wanted way more bricks here? Not 100, but 200, 500 it starts to become quite slow very quickly. Right now we're at 8.8 .8 .8 seconds for this extrusion to work, 4.4 seconds for this boundary surface to work, almost one second for this move to work. And then we have to convert to mesh. The reason why we have to convert to mesh, we explain in another um, video tutorial. We can leave the description down in, uh, below in the video. Um, but just also to go from b to mesh, that's, that's another 4.1 seconds to compute. So all together, we are, let's say this is 9, 10, uh, 14, 18 seconds, more or less, plus a little bit here and there. We get to, let's say, 20 seconds for this to compute. So basically it becomes very slow, especially if you start to increase the resolution to just be able to map this little puppy in our bricks. So what can we do? We can use transformations. How? So we have the same situation. All of this section is the same. This is how I, how I am 
sampling the image, how, how am I getting the pixels of the image and detecting uh, how much I want to move each of my, of my bricks. But now the way that I move my bricks and create my bricks are two transformations. So first, uh, here I create a single um, bounding, sorry, a single domain box with the dimensions that we already know. We know the brick length and the brick width. Then I convert it to mesh directly through the mesh box component. So this one uh, uh, with a count of one, one and one and one, because I just want one quad here. I don't need more than that. So I have a single mesh. Then I compute the points where I want to move it. So I already know my X and Y, sorry, my X and Z and my Y is computed by our image. And in that way, I can take my mesh, move it, and I get to the same result. Uh, but at a fraction of the time, before we had 20 seconds, now we have what? 300 milliseconds here and 140 seconds, 40 milliseconds here. So fraction of the time, same result. Um, just by using transformations instead of creating everything already in position, everything from scratch. This is still not the most efficient uh, way to make this. But here is where we get to the next risk, the next benefit of using transformations, and that's data transfer. So up to this point, if you are using just Grasshopper, you are good to go. But if then you want to use this in an online application through Shapediver, for example, then this will create a lot of um, uh, this is a lot of meshes that you are sending to an online application to the web. So if we were to join this, so the final result, we can see that we are sending 240,000 vertices and 60, yeah, 60,000 faces. So that's a lot of data. It's still not exaggerated, but it's a lot of data to which we could save we could make the transfer way faster. So that means that if you were to put this into, let's say an OBJ file or uh, some sort of file, all of this data needs to be stored there. And it's like if you were sending an image or if you were sending a video, all of the data that is necessary for this video, all of the data that is necessary for this uh, um, image needs to be sent somewhere. So you need to optimize, you need to compress the amount of data that you are sending to your online application. So let's go to data transfer, the benefit of data transfer. So here we have exactly the same that we had before. Here we have exactly the same that we had before. The only thing that is changing is exactly here. Uh, if we go to the shape diver plugin, here in the attribute section, we have something called the attach transformation component. And that one, what it does is it takes our geometry, in this case, a mesh box, which is the one that we had here of our brick, and it added, it, it adds, it attach these transformations inside the mesh. So it doesn't apply the transformation, it just attach them as information. So in this case, I'm sending just one single mesh plus a thousand transformations. So if we check here, the output, of this component is one mesh with 24 vertices and six faces. And if we check the output of this one, it's the same, a mesh of 24 vertices and six faces. But this mesh is full of transformations inside. So this means that we are sending now not, uh, how much was it? 200,000, 260,000. Um, vertices, yeah, I don't remember anymore, but we're not sending more than 200,000 vertices, but we're sending just 24 vertices. Of course, imagine how much the data will be compressed here. Hundreds of times we are compressing our data. And the only thing that we're sending is this mesh is rich in information. Now here, what if we want to see the result in, in uh, Grasshopper, no? Because here, this contains the transformations attached, but we cannot see. 
Then is when we use our shape diver display component because this component, of course, because this is specifically for shape diver, this component can read our transformations and show us the final result that we will see in shape diver because at the end, these transformations, the final positioning will be applied in shape diver. Um, so to be able to see the result also here in Grasshopper, then we need to use a shape diver display component, and then we get to the same point. So now we're the transferring the transferring of data is way faster. Now we could do use this method anywhere. So if we go back to where we were here, if we go back here to our windows, we can use exactly the same. So it's, it's replacing this component with our shape diver transform component. So that one is here, attach transformation component. So instead of using this one, I'm gonna use this one. And in that way, I can now also, um, also uh, optimize the data transfer to shape diver. So then I just need to put here the shape diver display component and I can see the final result. But, it, uh, but it's still just 24 vertices, six phases, nothing else. So those are the benefits of using transformations. First of all was the workflow. So we can be way more efficient instead of repeating ourselves again and again and again, we can compress our, our workflow and make it more efficient. Second one is optimization we can make our models 10 times, 100 times faster. And last one is data transfer. This is if you want to use an online, an online application and you want to send the, you want to send the transformations to, um, to an online application, in this case, through Shipdiver, then you can use our transform attached, attached transformation component. And as you can see here, I'm also using always this X value, that's what matters. Finally, I just want to show how far we can take this method because, well, okay, now we know that, are, that all, of these are our, all of these are our benefits, but how far can I take this? So if I come here to the pergola, this is another model I created. Um, I will, all of these uh, files will be attached down in the description, so you will be able to check it out. So the idea of this model was to create this uh, pergola that we see here, and pretty much that's also what we see here. We are focusing mainly on the general look of our model, uh, and not on the um, not on the little construction details. No, so bear that in mind. Um, here I have an explanation of one, what would be the most inefficient way to do it. That's what I just explained also in the first part. So here in this part, we are using boundary surfaces. We are using extrusions, uh, another boundary surface extrusion. And then at the end, we end up with a bunch of um, B-wraps that then we have to mesh with the mesh B-wrap component, and then that will take way more time. So if I enable this, we have here 74 milliseconds, so it's not that bad in that sense. Um, here we have 11 milliseconds, 13 milliseconds, so this starts to add up 37 milliseconds to end up with this result. So if I check here our final result, here we have the main structure and so here we have the pergolas, which actually, sorry, the lowbers. And this one, look, this one, because we have, how many we have here? 119, sorry, 196 uh, B-wraps, then, it's taking 600 milliseconds to compute. So this is already adding time 
for creating this pervert. So this is how to not do it. We will put this in, in the description so you can study it yourself. Now, how far we can take this? So here in this uh, part is how to do it optimized without materials. We have a single mesh. This is the one that we already checked in the other model. One by one, one, one by one, one by one by one mesh. And we are transforming this mesh to get our final result. All of this was done through transformations. No geometry was ever created here. Single mesh, few transformations, you get to this result. Um, if we get, if we check here, um, all of these groups, the only thing that they are doing is what we explained in the first part. They are using the X value of our transforms and compounding them, grouping, this com grouping these transformations to get the final result. Um, as you can see, no geometry comes here, no geometry comes here because I'm never creating geometry. The same here, the same in the next ones. And to create these ones, these, uh, these ones that are rotated, as you can see, we are kind of faking it a little bit uh, for the sake of optimization. And we are the, the actual diagonal piece is going inside our column, but um, we are using the same box. So that comes into here, the angle. So here is where it becomes way more um, complex a little bit of our transformations, but here is where we can use more than more, more uh, transformations um, combinations. So here, I'm scaling, then I'm rotating, and then I'm moving. So it's three instructions that I'm sending. Now, for this um, rotation and moving, I'm using a bit of trigonometry. So that's when you need a little bit of math here so that you can get uh, the final result without ever creating any geometry. Again, just to check, no geometry is added anywhere. All what I'm doing is taking out the X values. Uh, the same happens here, just mirroring, rotating, and compounding. Next one, the same, rotating, uh, moving, compounding. All of these are a, a combination of compounds everywhere of our transformation, so that at the end we end up with, in this case, 20 transformations. We apply the transformations, we get the final result. Now, of course, I want to send this to Shape Diver. So in this case, I'm going to use our um, attached transformation component to be able to uh, send our our um, to be able to send our transformations instead of sending um, all of these meshes. So instead of going through this component that is the local grasshopper component, which does, which will send twenty meshes, I'm sending here just one with attached transformations. The only difference you have to consider here is that we can just do that once per material or once per color. So in this case, for example, I wanted to have this uh, uh, darker color for the mainframe and this lighter color for the lovers. So that's why here at the end, I get two meshes, not just one, but it's just because one represents this color that is dark, and one represents this color that is light. So if I had way more materials that I want here, then we will have one mesh per material, but all full of um, full of uh, transformations of rich in data. So this is how far you can take it. Now here we have another one, which is um, an in-between solution because the only downside of using just transformations is that if you want to, for example, put here a wooden material, then you need to consider um, using a little bit more of traditional extrusions through mesh uh, instead of using all transformations. Because 
you need to also apply you need to also apply um, textual coordinates. So let me show you if I disable enable. Yeah, so here as you can see, I'm not just applying a color, but also this uh, like wooden material. Well, for that we do need the mesh uh, to be already stretched. So here, for example, here I have the column. It is already in the size, in the in the real size, not like in the other one where we had just a single one by one, one by one by one mesh, but it is in the real size. And um, and then is that I'm transforming it, putting it all where I need it. The next one will be the beams, and the next one the lowers. So this one in, at the end I end up with uh, five meshes. This is still very low. But it's just because each of these meshes also contains uh, texture coordinates so that we can apply these materials um, through the different texture coordinates. Now let's check this model in Shape Diver. Um, so here we have the model without uh, texture coordinates, without uh, materials. And then if we uh, change this model to any other size, this model is incredibly fast. Why? because we are sending a single little cube. So whatever uh, move that I do goes super, super fast. So even if I go to the to the biggest one, which has a lot of these um, lowers, even if I go to that one, the model is still loading incredibly fast. So here you can see that I have a lot of these uh, meshes that if you were to send all of these together, it will take way more time to compute. Because imagine how many vertices, how many uh, faces are here in terms of mesh, if you were not to send these just as transformations. So you can see how much benefits can bring you um, using a lot of these transformations instead of creating the geometry from scratch all the time. And that's all for today. I hope you learned something new. Please like this video down below and subscribe if you haven't done so. If you want to know more about Shapediver, don't forget to visit us at shapediver.com. See you next time.